The Sasanian Empire, also known as the Sassanid Empire, was a formidable Iranian dynasty that ruled over Persia from 224 to 651 AD. Emerging as a formidable force in the aftermath of the fall of the Parthian Empire, the Sasanians established their capital at Ctesiphon and embarked on a period of territorial expansion and cultural flourishing. Known for their administrative prowess, military might, and patronage of the arts and sciences, the Sasanian kings left a lasting legacy on Persian history and culture. However, the swift conquests of the Islamic caliphates marked the end of Sasanian rule and the beginning of a new chapter in the history of Persia and the Middle East. Hello, welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you, and if you're coming back, it's good to have you with me once more. If you'd like to support the channel, you may follow the links to the Patreon in the comments and description. Otherwise, if you feel inclined to like, comment, and subscribe, do that. If not, then just enjoy the video however you deem it fit. Now, without further ado, let's get on to our topic for today. A history of the Sassanid Empire. The transition from the Parthian Empire to the Sasanian Empire marks a pivotal period in ancient history. Yet, due to its conflicting accounts, it's shrouded in a great deal of historical mystery. Well, we may start with the main character. The Sasanian Empire was founded in Eshtakar by Ardashir I. Let's talk about him for a little while. Ardashir's father, Papak, initially ruled over the kingdom of Kir, but by 200 he had ousted Gochihir and established himself as the leader of the Basrangids. Papak's mother, Rodag, hailed from a prominent family in Paz, further strengthening their grip over the region. Together with his eldest son, Shapur, Papak extended their influence across all of Pars. However, after Papak's death, a power struggle ensued between Ardashir, the then governor of Darbgurt, and his elder brother Shapur. Sources suggest that Shapur met his demise when a building collapsed on top of him. Bad way to go. Well, despite protests from the other brothers, Ardashir declared himself the ruler of Pars by 208. Upon assuming the title of Shah, Ardashir moved the capital further south to Ardashir Quara, modern-day Firuzabad. This city, nestled among high mountains and fortified by narrow passes, became the focal point of Ardashir's efforts to consolidate power. Surrounded by a circular wall, likely inspired by Darb Gerd's defences, Ardashir's palace stood proudly in the northern part of the city. With Pars now firmly under his control, Ardashir embarked on rapid expansion, asserting authority over neighbouring provinces such as Kerman, Isfahan, Susiana, and Messene. Artabanes IV, the Parthian king, couldn't help but take notice of Ardashir's growing influence, and initially dispatched the governor of Khuzestan to confront him. However, Ardashir emerged victorious in the ensuing battles. In a bold move, Artabanus himself confronted Ardashir at Hormozgan, where he met his demise. If you're not sure who these new players are, well, 
I refer you to my video on the Parthian Empire. Now, with the Parthian ruler well and truly out of the picture, Ardashir sees the opportunity to invade the western provinces of the now defunct Parthian Empire, further solidifying his ascendancy. During the transition from the Parthian to Sasanian Empire, Ardashir capitalized on the internal divisions within the Arsacid dynasty, consolidating his authority mainly in the south with very minimal interference from the Parthians. Benefiting somewhat from the geographical isolation of the province of Fars, Ardashir then declared himself the sole ruler of Persia in 224 at Tsesiphon, assuming the title Shah Han Shah, or King of Kings. This marked the end of the 400-year-old Parthian Empire and the beginning of the new Sassanid rule. Now, despite facing local rebellions, Ardashir I expanded his empire eastward and northwestward, conquering territories such as Sakastan, Gurgan, Khorasan, Balkh, and Khorasmia while adding Bahrain and Mosul to Sassanid possessions. Although later inscriptions claim the submission of various kingdoms to Ardashir, it is more likely that these occurred during the reign of his son, Shapur I. Ardashir wasn't done there. He also launched incursions into Roman territory, raiding deep into Roman lands in 230 and leading campaigns into Greater Khorasan from 233 onwards, extending his power to regions like Khwarazm and Sistan. Now Shapur, his son, continued his father's expansionist policies, conquering Bactria and the western portion of the Kushan Empire also while engaging with several different conflicts with Rome. Although Shapur I captured Carhe and Nisbis, Carhe being the site of a famous Roman defeat, his advances into Roman Mesopotamia were met with quite a bit of resistance. The Roman general, Timisiteus, defeated the Persians at Resana in 243, prompting Gordian III's advance down the Euphrates, which ended in Gordian's death, and enabled Shapur to negotiate a favourable peace treaty with the new emperor, Philip the Arab. This treaty that was just negotiated secured substantial payments from Rome to Persia, further strengthening the Sasanian Empire. After these initial victories, Shapur resumed his campaign against the Romans, defeating them at Barbalissos in 253, and likely plundering Antioch. Subsequent Roman counterattacks under Emperor Valerian ended in disaster with Valerian actually being captured by Shapur and held as a prisoner for the rest of his life. To commemorate his victory, Shapur commissioned impressive rock reliefs in Naqsh es Rostam and Bishapur, as well as monumental inscriptions near Persepolis. Exploiting his successor, Shapur advanced into Anatolia in 260, but he faced defeats at the hands of the Romans and their Palmyrene ally, Odoanathus. He suffered significant losses, including the capture of his harem and the relinquishment of all Roman territories he had occupied. Back to square one for Shapur. But it wasn't all just about warfare and conquering. 
Shapur also focused on extensive development projects, including the construction of Iran's first dam bridge and the founding of new cities like Nishapur and Bishapur, which attracted quite a few migrants, notably from Roman territories, including Christians, who managed to find their religious freedom under Sassanid rule. Remember that Rome was a little bit far off the Edict of Milan, and the reign of Constantine, which allowed Christians to worship without being murdered for it. Now, Shapur was particularly supportive of Manichaeism, protecting Mani and sending Manichaean missionaries abroad. Additionally, his friendship with Babylonian rabbi Samuel provided a respite for the Jewish community from oppressive laws. Life wasn't so bad under Shapur, it seems. However, his tolerant policies were not continued by his successors. Bahram I succumbed to pressure from the Zoroastrian priesthood to persecute Mani and his followers. Similarly, Bahram II followed suit, giving in to the demands of the Zoroastrian clergy. During the reign of Narsay, the Sassanids engaged in another war with the Romans. Although Narse initially achieved success against Emperor Galerius near Callinicum in 296, he was, however, decisively defeated by the Romans in subsequent battles. Galerius's strategic reinforcement and the advantageous Armenian terrain proved to be quite an advantage for the Roman forces, and this all culminated to consecutive victories over Narse. During the second encounter, Roman forces seized Narse's camp, treasury, harem, and they even took his wife. Galerius pressed further into Media and Adiabene, securing successive victories notably near Erzurum, and capturing Nisbis before October the 1st, 298. Advancing down the Tigris, he captured Tessaphon. Meanwhile, Narse had sent an envoy to Galerius, begging for the return of his family. Well, this led to peace negotiations that were commenced in the spring of 299, overseen by Diocletian and Galerius. The new terms of the peace were severe for Persia. They knew they had them backed into a corner. They had to succeed territory to Rome, with the Tigris becoming the boundary between the two empires. Armenia was also returned to Roman control, with the fort of Ziatha marking its border. Also, Caucasian Iberia pledged allegiance to Rome under Roman supervision. Nisibis, now under Roman rule, became the sole trade conduit between Persia and Rome. Additionally, Rome gained control over the five satrapies between the Tigris and Armenia. Well, nobody felt very good about this on the Persian side, of course. In the aftermath of this defeat, Narse relinquished the throne, and he died not a year later, leaving the Sassanid throne to his son, Hormiz II. However, unrest permeated the land, and despite suppressing result, revolts rather, in Sarkistan and Kushan, Hormiz II struggled to control the nobles. His reign was short-lived, as he was killed by Bedouins during a hunting trip in 309. Following Hormiz II's demise, northern Arab tribes began raiding and pillaging western cities of the empire, 
including Fars, the ancestral homeland of the Sassanid rulers. Concurrently, Persian nobles orchestrated the demise of Hormid's eldest son, blinded the second, and imprisoned the third, who did later manage to escape into Roman territory. The throne was reserved for Shapur II, the unborn child of one of Hormid's wives, who was symbolically crowned in utero. The crown placed upon his mother's stomach in a ceremony. In his early years, the empire was governed by his mother and the nobles, but upon reaching adulthood, Shapur II assumed full authority, and he did indeed prove to be a vigorous and capable leader. Shapur initiated his reign by leading his disciplined armies southward, where he decisively defeated the Arab invaders, securing the southern regions of the empire. Then turning his attentions to the west, he launched his first campaign against the Romans, achieving significant victories in battles, but facing setbacks in capturing territories due to unsuccessful sieges of the strategic city of Nisibis. Despite Persian successes in taking Singara and Amida, these gains were temporary, as the Romans quickly rallied and reclaimed their lost cities. The progress of these campaigns, however, was interrupted by a nomadic incursion along the eastern borders, posing a threat to Transaxonia, a vital area controlling the Silk Road. Shapur II diverted his forces eastward to confront the nomads while local commanders conducted raids against the Romans. After crushing the Central Asian tribes, he annexed the region as a new province. Around 125, Shapur regained control over the Kushano Sasanian kingdom in the east, extending his dominion into modern day Afghanistan and Pakistan. This victory facilitated cultural expansion, with Sasanian art reaching Transaxiana and even influencing regions as distant as China. In 359, Shapur, along with the nomadic king Grumbates, launched his second campaign against the Romans, reclaiming Singara and Amida. In response to this, Roman Emperor Julian took a deep incursion into Persian territory, defeating Shapur's forces at Ctesiphon. However, Julian failed to capture the capital, and was actually killed during his retreat. His successor, Jovian, cornered on the east bank of the Tigris, relinquished all provinces ceded to Rome in 298, along with Nisibis and Singara, to secure safe passage for his army out of Persia. Toward the end of Shapur II's reign, around 370, the Sasanians faced challenges in maintaining control over Bactria, as invaders from the north, including the Kedarites, Hephthalites, and Alcon Huns gradually seized the region. These invaders initially minted coins modelled on Sasanian designs, featuring busts resembling Sasanian kings Shapur II and Shapur III, alongside the Alcon Tamga and the inscription Alcono in Bactrian script. Shapur implemented a strict religious policy during his rule, overseeing the completion of the collection of the Avesta, that's a Zoroastrian text, punishing heresy and apostasy, and persecuting Christians, 
a response to the Christianization efforts in the Roman Empire led by Constantine the Great, which is a little ironic since in former times Christians fleeing the persecution of the Romans ended up in Persian territory. Now it was the opposite way around. Well, despite giving the Christians a hard time, he maintained somewhat favorable relations with the Jewish community, which enjoyed comparative freedom and benefits under his reign. Well, at the time of Shapur II's death, the Persian Empire stood stronger than ever. With eastern adversaries subdued, and Armenia firmly under Persian control. From the death of Shapur II until the first coronation of Kavad I, a relatively peaceful period prevailed between the Sasanian Empire and the Eastern Roman, or Byzantine Empire, marked by only two brief conflicts, one in 421-22, and another eighteen years later in 440. Despite fluctuations in religious policies under different rulers, the administrative system established during Shapur II's reign remained robust, ensuring the empire's effective functioning. Succession after Shapur II saw a series of relatively weak rulers, at least compared to him, but he was a hard act to follow. His half-brother, Ardashir II, and son, Shapur III, lacked their predecessor's governing abilities, as did Bahram IV, who reigned from 388 to 99. During this period, Armenia was divided between the two empires, with the Sasanians reasserting their control over Greater Armenia, while the Byzantines, well, they got to retain the western portion of Armenia. Yazdegerd I, 399-421, who is often compared to Constantine the Great, ushered in a relatively peaceful era with the Romans, using his diplomatic skill religious tolerance, and support for religious minorities. His reign saw an end to Christian persecution, and alliances formed with figures like Theodosius II. Baram V, 421-438, Yazdegerd's son and successor, is celebrated in history and myth alike. He extended Sasanian influence into Central Asia, crushed an invasion by the Hephthalites, and made strides in consolidating control over Armenia, turning it into a fully-fledged province of the empire. Yazdegerd II, ruling from 438 to 57, demonstrated a mixed approach to governance. While he exhibited moderation in some aspects, he pursued a harsh policy towards minority religions, in particular Christianity. In contrast, his predecessor, Yazdegerd I, was very tolerant. Well, the Battle of Avayar in 451 where Armenian subjects led by Vardan Mamikonian defended their right to practice Christianity stands as a significant testament to the struggle for religious freedom. This affirmation was later solidified by Navarsak Treaty in 484. Now back to Yazdegerd II. At the onset of his reign, he launched military campaigns against the Byzantine Empire in 441 and the Kidarites in 443. Despite the initial hostilities, peace was restored relatively quickly, at least with the Byzantines, while the campaign against the Kidarites proved somewhat more protracted. 
Yazdegerd II's suspicion of Christians also led to their expulsion from positions of authority and even military service. This was the pretense for a larger-scale persecution within the empire. Even in Armenia, he sought to suppress Christianity, culminating in the Battle of Vartanants in 451. Although Christianity remained deeply rooted among the Armenians. Towards the end of his reign, Yazdegerd II continued to contend with the Kidarites until his death in 457. Hormitz III, his younger son, succeeded him, but faced internal challenges, including conflicts with his eldest brother Peros I and confrontations with the Hephthalites in Bactria. His rule was short-lived, as he was slain by Peros in 459 amid the ongoing political power struggles. In the early 5th century, Iran faced invasions from nomadic groups, including the Hephthalites, also called the White Huns. Now initially rulers like Baram V and Yazdegerd II did manage to repel the attacks and push the invaders back eastward. However, towards the end of the century, the Hephthalites returned, and they dealt a decisive blow to Peros I in 483, subsequently plundering parts of eastern Iran for more than two years, and imposing heavy tribute. These incursions plunged the kingdom into quite a great deal of turmoil and chaos, prompting Peros I to launch a campaign against the Hephthalites, those white Huns. However, his army was ambushed and defeated in the desert near Balkh, resulting in Peros's death and the loss of his entire army. With major Sasanian cities falling under Hephthalite rule, Sukra, a member of the Parthian House of Karen, rallied a new force to halt further Hephthalite advances. Following the demise of Peroz, his brother, Balash, assumed the throne, but faced discontent from the nobility and clergy, leading to his disposition after only a short four years. Sukra then orchestrated the appointment of Peroz's son, Kavad I, as the new Shah, ushering in a period of reform and somewhat energetic rule. Kavad I implemented reforms supporting the Mazdakite sect, aiming to challenge the influence of the magnates and aristocracy by advocating for wealth redistribution. However, these reforms led to Kavad's deposition and even imprisonment in 496, with his brother, Jamasp, ascending to the throne in his place. Jamasp, who was known for his benevolent rule and strict adherence to Zoroastrianism, reduced quite a few taxes, and aimed to uplift the peasantry. Nevertheless, Kavad I, aided by Hephthalites, soon returned and reclaimed the throne, prompting Jamasp to step down peacefully. Although Jamasp's fate after Kavad's restoration remains unclear, it is believed he received favorable treatment from his brother's court. Now, following the second reign of Kavad I, the Sasanian Empire actually experienced a resurgence, marking the beginning of its second golden era. With the backing of the Heftalites, Kavad launched a series of military campaigns against the Romans. In 502, he captured Theodosiopolis in Armenia, although it was soon lost shortly after. 
but the following year he managed to seize Amida on the Tigris. However, in 504 an invasion of Armenia by Western Huns prompted an armistice, leading to the return of Amida to Roman control and the signing of a peace treaty in 506. Nevertheless, tensions persisted, and in 521 Kavad lost control of Lazica to the Romans, triggering further conflicts. By 527, Roman efforts to strengthen their positions near the frontier were met with resistance, and a Roman offensive against Nisibus was repelled. In 530, Cavad dispatched an army under Perizes to attack the crucial Roman city of Dara. Despite outnumbering the Romans, Perizes suffered a defeat at the Battle of Dara against the Roman general Belisarius. In the same year, a Persian force led by Mir Mihro was also defeated by Roman forces at Satala. However, in 531, a Persian army, accompanied by a contingent from Lake Lakhmid tribe under Almundir III, achieved victory over Belisarius at the Battle of Kalinicum. Subsequently, an eternal peace, as they called it, was reached in the year of 532. Now, although Kavad I faced challengers from the Hephthalatites, he managed to restore order within the empire, achieved notable success against the Eastern Romans, and initiated reforms in taxation and internal administration. Additionally, he founded several cities, some of which were named in his honor, further solidifying his legacy during this period of Sasanian resurgence. Following the reign of Kabat I, his son, Khosrau I, also known as Anu Shirvan, ascended to the throne, marking the beginning of a celebrated era in Sassanid rule, notably 531-79. Khosrow I is renowned for his significant reforms, aimed at revitalizing the aging administrative structure of the Sasanian Empire. And one of his most notable reforms was the implementation of a more rational tax system, based on a comprehensive survey of land ownership that was initiated by his father, but perfected under his rule. He also made efforts to enhance the welfare and revenue of the empire. Prior to Khosrow I's reign, powerful feudal lords had maintained their own military forces and retinues. However, Khosrow introduced a new professional force of knights called Deccans, who were equipped and paid by the central government and bureaucracy. This move served to strengthen ties between the army and the bureaucracy with the central government, reducing the influence of local lords. Also during his reign, Khosrow engaged in both military conquests and diplomatic maneuvers. In 532, Emperor Justinian I of the Byzantine Empire paid a substantial tribute of 440,000 pieces of gold to Khosrow as part of a larger peace treaty. However, in 540, Khosrow violated the treaty and launched a full-scale invasion of Syria, sacking Antioch and extracting hefty sums from other cities. His military successes continued with the defection of Lazica to the Persian side in 541 and the defeat of a major Byzantine offensive in Armenia. Later, the Lazic War began in 541, when Khosrow entered Lazica, captured Byzantine strongholds, and established a protectorate over the region. 
The conflict continued intermittently, with a five-year truce in 545 being interrupted by further hostilities. Eventually, Lazarus expelled the Persian garrison with Byzantine assistance, leading to Byzantine control over the region when peace was finally concluded in 562. Three years later, in 565, Justinian I's death marked the ascension of Justin II, who halted subsidies to Arab chieftains to prevent raids on Byzantine territory in Syria. Concurrently, unrest erupted in Armenia and Iberia, fueled by the construction of a fire temple, that's a Zoroastrian worship place, by the Sassanid governor of Armenia, and the subsequent massacre of several influential figures. Justin II exploited the Armenian revolt to cease annual payments to Khosrow for the defense of the Caucasus passes. During the reign of Khosrow I, more significant events unfolded in both military campaigns and diplomacy. By 573, the Byzantines welcomed Armenian allies and initiated a siege of Nisibis in Sassanid territory. However, internal discord among the Byzantine generals led to the abandonment of the siege, and they were subsequently besieged in the city of Dara by the Persians, resulting in its capture. Exploiting this victory, the Persians ravaged Syria prompting Justin II to agree to annual payments in exchange for a five-year truce on the Mesopotamian front, though hostilities elsewhere continued regardless. In 576, Khosrow embarked on his final campaign, launching an offensive into Anatolia, that's central Turkey in modern terms, while the Persians sacked Sebasteia and Melitene. The campaign ultimately ended disastrously, as they suffered heavy losses and were defeated outside of Melitene. Seizing the opportunity presented by Persian disarray, the Byzantines raided deep into Sassanid territory, and even launched amphibious attacks across the Caspian Sea. Although Khosrow initially sought peace, a victory by his general Tam Khosrow in Armenia renewed his resolve to continue the war, leading to the resumption of hostilities in the broader Mesopotamian area. The Armenian revolt concluded with a general amnesty, bringing Armenia back to Sassanid control. Now around 570, Khosrow intervened in South Arabia at the request of Ma'ad Karib, establishing a base near present-day Aden. The Sassanids successfully occupied the capital, Sanal, and Saif, son of Ma'ad Karib, became king. This intervention allowed the Sassanids to control sea trade with the east, although the South Arabian kingdom eventually renounced Sassanid overlordship. Another Persian expedition in 598 annexed southern Arabia as a Sassanid province. Khosrow I's reign witnessed that great rise of the Deccans, village lords who played a crucial role in Sassanid provincial administration, but also taxation efforts. He invested greatly in infrastructure, enhancing his capital and founding new towns, while rebuilding canals and farms that were destroyed by previous wars. He practiced a comparative amount of religious tolerance, though he designated Zoroastrianism as the official state religion. I've got a full video on Zoroastrianism if you want to know what that is. Quite complex. 
He also remained unperturbed when one of his sons embraced Christianity, and this exemplified his inclusive approach to religious diversity. Round about the same time, if a Roman emperor's son had have embraced the old pagan ways or a different religion, well, perhaps they would not have been met with such tolerance. But that is speculation in itself. Well, after the reign of Khosra I, Hormizd IV ascended to the Sasanian throne in 579. However, the war with the Byzantines continued to rage inconclusively. In 589, the general Baram Chobin, who had been dismissed and humiliated by Hormizd, rose in revolt. The following year, Hormiz was overthrown in a palace coup, and his son, Khosrow II, was placed on the throne. Despite this change, Baram's revolt continued, resulting in Khosrow II's defeat and his flight to Byzantine territory, while Baram seized the throne as Baram VI. Khosrow II sought assistance from the Byzantine Emperor Maurice against Baram, offering to cede the Western Caucasus to the Byzantines. To solidify the alliance, Khosrow married Maurice's daughter Miriam. Together with the combined Byzantine-Persian army under Khosrow and Byzantine generals Narsis and John Miastakon, they rebelled against Baram and defeated him at the Battle of Blarathon in 591. Upon Khosrow's restoration to power, he fulfilled his promise by handing over control of Western Armenia and Caucasian Iberia to the Byzantines. With the peace established between the two empires, they were able to redirect their focus on military matters elsewhere. Khosrow concentrated on the eastern frontier of the Sassanid Empire, while Maurice restored Byzantine control in the Balkans. Around 600, the Heftalites continued raiding deep into Sassanid territory, prompting Khosrow to recall Sumbat IV Bagratuni from Persian Armenia to help him repel them. With the aid of a Persian prince named Datoyan, Sumbat successfully repelled the Heftalites, and even plundered their domains in eastern Khorasan. Because why not? Following Maurice's overthrow and death in 602, Khosrow used the murder of his benefactor as a pretext to begin a new invasion of the Byzantine territories. Benefiting from the ongoing civil war in the Byzantine Empire, and, by the way, facing very little resistance, Khosrow's generals systematically subdued heavily fortified frontier cities in Mesopotamia and Armenia. They overran Syria, capturing Antioch in 611, and continued their advance relatively unchecked. In 614, Jerusalem fell, then Alexandria in 619, and the rest of Egypt by 621. The Sassanid Empire approached the restoration of the Achaemenid boundaries of the glory days, while the Byzantine Empire teetered on the brink of collapse. This expansion was accompanied by a flourishing of Persian art, music, and agriculture marking a remarkable peak in Sassanid power, but also cultural achievement. The campaign of Khosrau II, while initially successful, did unfortunately drain the Persian army and treasury. In an attempt to replenish the nat national finances, Khosrau imposed heavy taxes on the population. 
You see where this is going? Well, naturally, the people weren't impressed by this. What's the point of living in a great empire if you don't have any cash to enjoy it? As his empire teetered on the brink of collapse, Heraclius of the Byzantine Empire rallied his diminished forces and launched a daring counter-offensive between 622 and 27. Heraclius campaigned aggressively in Anatolia and the Caucasus, achieving a series of victories against the Persian commanders such as Sharbaraz, Shahin, and Shakraplakan. He also secured aid from the Khazars and the western Turkic Khaganate. These victories were pivotal in shifting the momentum of the conflict, and shift the momentum they did. In response to Heraclius's resurgence, Khosrau coordinated with Avar and Slavic forces to lay a full siege to Constantinople in 626. Despite their effort, the siege failed as the Byzantine fleet effectively blocked attempts to ferry Persian forces across the Bosphorus. Undeterred, Heraclius launched a winter invasion of Mesopotamia in 627-28. Despite the departure of his Khazar allies, he managed to defeat the Persian army commanded by Razdag at the Battle of Nineveh. Heraclius then marched down the Tigris, inflicting further damage on Persian territory by sacking Khosrau's palace at Dastagerd. Now, although Heraclius was unable to attack Sesiphon due to the destruction of bridges on the Narawan Canal, he conducted additional raids before withdrawing into northwestern Iran. These military successes marked a turning point in the conflict, demonstrating Heraclius's resilience and strategic prowess while dealing a significant blow to Khosrau's ambitions. The downfall of Khosrau II, marked by devastating defeats and internal turmoil, along with a very angry population, left the Sassanid Empire vulnerable and weakened. His son, Kavad II, who seized power after Khosrau's overthrow, quickly sought to end the war and withdraw from occupied territories. However, his reign was short-lived, as the Sassanid Empire was plunged into chaos and civil war over the next few years, with multiple rulers ascending the throne in rapid succession, each as popular as the last. Now amid this turmoil, Yazdegerd III, a grandson of Khosrau I, emerged from hiding in Estakir, and ascended to the throne by early 632. However, the Sassanids faced a new threat from the Arab tribes, united under the banner of Islam, who began raiding Persian territory the same year. A time of warfare, economic decline, and of course heavy taxation had left the Sassanid Empire vulnerable to the swift conquests of a newly expanding Arab army. Now, despite the valiant efforts to resist the Arab invasion, the Sassanids struggled to mount an effective defense. Yazdegerd III, still a rather young man and inexperienced leader, faced challenges in uniting the fragmented empire against the onslaught of Arab forces. While the Byzantines, once a formidable adversary, were also under pressure from this new expansion, the Sassanids found themselves unable to withstand the disciplined and determined Arab armies. Led by commanders like Khalid ibn Walid, the Arab forces swiftly conquered territories in Iraq and Syria, 
despite occasional setbacks such as the Battle of the Bridge in 634. The threat posed by Arab armies persisted. As they continued their advance into Sassanid territory, eventually leading to the downfall of the Sassanid Empire and the rise of the Islamic Caliphate in Persia. The defeat of the Sassanid Empire at the Battle of al qadisiyah in 637 rather, marked a turning point in its history. With the fall of Sesiphon and the capture of its vast treasury by the Muslim forces, the Sassanid governor was left financially crippled and emotionally destroyed, one can imagine. Attempts by Sassanid governors to resist the invaders were hampered by the lack of a strong central authority, leading to further defeats, including the even more decisive Battle of Nihuand. Now following these defeats, Yazdegerd III, accompanied by some Persian nobles, fled to the eastern province of Khorasan. However, his escape was short-lived as he was assassinated by a miller of all people in Merv in 651. With the Sassanid royal family scattered and the empire's military and financial resources depleted, its resistance against the Arab invaders fell to pieces. Now, Despite the swift collapse of the Sassanid Empire, resistance persisted in many Iranian cities, with revolts repeatedly suppressed by the Islamic caliphates. The local population, while initially remaining as dhimmi subjects of the Muslim state and being forced to pay a tax for not being Muslim, resisted the pressure to convert the adoption of the old Sassanid land tax, known as Karaj, provided some continuity in governance, with occasional surveys conducted by Caliph Umar to ensure that the taxes were fair. In the aftermath of the Sassanid Empire's fall, Persian nobles who fled settled in Central Asia, contributing to the spread of Persian culture and language in the region. This period also witnessed the emergence of the Samanid dynasty, which sought to revive Sassanid traditions and played a significant role in preserving Persian heritage amidst the changing political landscape of the Islamic world. And there you have it. A full history of the Sasanian or Sassanid Empire. Did you have fun? I know I did. It makes you wonder if they weren't so busy trying to settle those old grudges with the Byzantines, perhaps they could have organized a little bit better, and they wouldn't have been steamrolled by the Islamic Caliphate. Can you imagine what it would have been like if the Persians, those believers of Zoroastrianism, if they had have been the ones who stopped the Islamic warlords. How different would our world look? Imagine if these days the Middle East was filled with Zoroastrian fire temples instead of mosques. Now, that's just a bit of historical imagination right there. We can't really say whether the world would be better off or worse off, but we certainly can speculate. Well, I'd like to say a big thank you to my Mega Chat tier patron, Stark Factory. If you would like to support the channel as he does, then you need only follow the links in the description and comments. Otherwise, thank you again for listening, and I wish you all the best. Like, comment, subscribe, you know what to do. Good night, everyone. I'll see you next time.